In open source, community matters more than you might think. Community is the foundation for everything that happens in an open source project or an open source business. At the Hacking Open Source Business Podcast, we've talked to over two dozen experts, founders, investors, and others in the open source space, and we've asked them tons of questions on how they've taken the community and supercharged their projects and their work. Let's talk to them about how community matters to them. Right? When you're building software for free and you're like, well, I'm giving it away, a lot of people just tend to help you, right? Because they're getting a lot of value out of it. And it's not like you're hard selling them like in Gucci loafers on the golf course, right? Like you're, you're building something you love. People respond to the value and, and they, they really helped us, you know, become um, a, a vendor to the federal government. First metric is that we have around like, you know, 5,000 plus member community around the world, okay? And uh, we have uh, built around uh, five to six ambassadors in different, different countries who are like, okay. uh, you know, running these biggest two meetups in their different, different localities, right? So I That's think awesome. uh, it's a huge success for us that uh, some people are taking initiative and they are actually working on Bagus2 and doing these small meetups in the locality, okay? So community is like one of the big uh, metric for us, okay, I would say that uh, we have been able to build a very good community, very supportive community, okay? They, uh, all of them are very collaborative and working together and like so many things, right? That's a one factor for us, okay? And obviously there are a lot of factors which you can see on GitHub. Just go on GitHub, you'll find 6,000 plus stars in just like four years, 75,000 plus downloads and more than 25,000 plus, 25,000 approx merchants whose websites are currently live and running successfully on Megastore.com right now framework, okay? Now, if I talk about the revenue part, that's a very, you know, uh, hazy, uh, I would say, uh, that's revenue is a, such a thing which you cannot relate with open source, right? Because what is open source? If not giving back to community, right? Something for free, okay? You cannot, you cannot just go to investor and show some balance sheet that, hey, I need funding. This is the open source project, right? It's very hard to get a funding for open source, okay? It is our thesis, really. Like, you know, we think that, like, so this is kind of like our slogan. We say, like, software is eating the world. We think open source is eating software faster than software is eating the world. So, like, there's this, there's two curves that you could visualize. There's, like, a big curve of, like, software eating the world. And that's, like, a huge curve at this point. There's a sort of a slope on that curve that's kind of starting to slow, though, because, like, so much of the world has been eaten by software so it's a giant you know 10 trillion dollars of value captured by you know all the consumer internet companies all the SaaS products all the big uh, 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 proprietary software companies but the area under the curve of open source eating software it's a tinier it's much smaller area under that curve but the curve is growing faster so that's yeah. basically what we see as a, a much more inter interesting and exciting and compelling opportunity. It's not that building an open source company is the only way and, and that's the only path to like success or, you know, that that's that's the right way or the wrong way. It's, it's just the, the thing that we happen to focus on and it allows us to have a lot of um, clarity going back to your question about like, yeah, the, you know, there's a lot of markets that you could look at and say if they're large enough and if they're sort of um, exhibiting certain characteristics that show there's a slowing rate of innovation or there's perhaps some monopolization or some kind of oligopoly dynamic forming there open source is just this incredible force for accelerating innovation um, accelerating commoditization and as a consequence fundamentally changing market dynamics and, and characteristics of markets uh, which obviously unlock you know new business opportunities As we've said, the open source community is vital to any open source project. But in order for us to understand if we're doing the right things, we need to be able to measure it. And measuring the open source community takes a lot of different forms. So what we've done is we've asked many of these people in the open source space, many of these luminaries, how they measure it. What sort of things do they look for? What are the key indicators, whether their community is doing the right things or not? And here's what they said. There's metrics like, like the amount of activities, right? You can measure DevRel by like, okay, hey, the, the, this DevRel person wrote this many blog posts a week and spoke and, and respond to this many GitHub issues and, and Twitter, right? So it's like, that's one. And then there's also kind of um, other metrics, okay, growth of like followers on Twitch and YouTube and, and your social media. 
Um, like at HashiCorp, kind of we we at the end had a really large kind of DevRel community team, and kind of like our north star was like the the amount of traffic that we drove to our Learn platform because it, it was self serve, and so that to us was um, important, right? That the amount of people that were going in and learning about our stuff was and without us because right early days at HashiCorp we were teaching trainings at all of our conferences. We were doing all those trainings, right? So imagine having an engineer and a DevRel person for a full day teaching 15 people that doesn't scale. Um, so that was kind of like the overall DevRel metric at HashiCorp. And then of course, each team had its own specific uh, like number, of, like tracking core contributor sentiment over time, um, tracking like ambassador engagement over time, tracking like Slack engagement or GitHub discussions. So there's various ways you can kind of look at like the health of the business. I, I think I, I have several kind of key, you know, I always think about it, right? As a doctor, you know, you're looking at height, weight, you know, blood pressure, heart rate, you know, all these like high level signals that can not necessarily give you diagnostic capability, but they can give you a sense of whether this person is doing well or not. Um, and, and those metrics for me, like if I take the equivalent, right, my kind of uh, immediate physical exam metrics to check in on things are um, our Slack growth. So, you know, are we having new developers and new users come into the Slack? Um, that tells me a few good things, right? It means it's discoverable. It means they're engaged enough that they care. Um, and it means that the community itself is growing. And, and that's kind of a crucial kind of top of funnel thing. Um, I look at things like new contributors, right? Which can tell us whether or not we're being discovered in the right orbits from an open source perspective and whether or not our documentation, our onboarding, our first issues are good enough that they're, you know, welcoming to, to new contributors. That's a key thing. Um, I certainly look at, um, I certainly look at kind of retention, right? Um, and, and figuring out like, where where are we suddenly losing people's interest or enthusiasm or where where are they dropping off and figuring out why um and it's not always like a science right it's sometimes a bit of detective work um but that kind of retention piece is key is figuring out like are you um are you doing the things that kind of keep people um interested and, and excited and there's a few kind of proxy measures i use for that you know like um sometimes things as simple as like your posts on Slack getting a lot of emoji responses, like our, our huddles on Zoom, like having good registration levels, um, or people sharing it on Twitter, like that, those are good proxy signals for engagement. Um, and then with our power users or enterprise users, like how quickly are they responding to us when we, you know, check in with them? Um, th those, those kind of things are really key. Um, but I'm, in our stage of the game, I'm very focused certainly on kind of like top of funnel things for lack of less businessy phrases where it's like, how how much visibility are we getting and how consistently um, and how much is that translating into clones? Um, how much is it translating into new Slack users? Um, I used to pay quite close attention to stars, but um, I think what I found, which maybe is not such a unique experience is our growth in the first four months really corresponded to the star growth, right? Um, we went from, you know, a hundred to a thousand stars on launch week. Um, and then we gradually kept building towards 2000. Um, and, and I could say from the ins outside, you know, from the inside, it felt to me like our growth corresponded to that chart. Um, but since then our kind of stars have somewhat, you know, plateaued. Um, but the good news is, is that our growth has like, gone on a skyrocket since. And I, I just think that's an interesting point, um, which is to say that I'd love for our stars to keep growing, and I'm sure they will, um, but that it stopped becoming kind of a useful measure um, around three or four months in. Depends on the scenario. Is it your own project that you are open sourcing and you have some business goal for your own software? Is it software that you're looking to utilize that someone else has developed and you want to evaluate is this a good project to rely on and to build on so depending on on the use case there are different metrics that i would look at but the common denominator is just number of contributions and the activity in the project because and this is something that i found in my phd research a healthy open source project has three things. 
One is quality source code. One is the resources to do development and GitHub provides all of that almost for free for most projects. Most projects don't need more than what is already provided. But then the third one, and usually I list that as first, is an active community. Because without an active community, there's no development, there's no advancement in software and technology moves so fast. If the software is not being updated and maintained, it'll be obsolete one or two years down the road. I think the key for me is like, what's your primary metrics and like, and why are you tracking them? Because I think what you're tracking and like, you're gonna have the biggest impact on like, where you're putting your time, I think affects kind of the quality or like what you're doing with that content too. Um, and it, you could, yeah, you could do something that's like really salesy and like really gonna push hard to convert people and it's just gonna like turn people away or push people to like sign up for GitHub stars and forget that like your community isn't growing, but like it's getting a ton of hits and growing, but like it's not helping much. There are such such metrics and they are they are indirect and they help us. I also would go a lot with, with, with anecdotes, like what does my mom's cousin say about Maria? <laughs> if she doesn't know what it is, well, that's a bad measure. That, that's a bad metric. If, if she says that she read about it here and there and, and, and uh, know something about what it is, well, then it will probably have a brand recognition that that, that, that helps. But to, to give you a very serious and hard answer is, is looking at Jira and looking at, at GitHub. Mm. So looking at how those contributions grow and how, how they are being dealt with and like votes on, on, on Jira items. That's a way for us to know what people really, really wish for. Now, like those stars uh, that, that, that come out of those, they, they, they absolutely help. I have a lot of measurements that I run. <laughs> the, the most meaningful are uh, mostly around engagement metrics, like how many people show up to an event, how many people engage with your content. I mean, because you're, you're building content for people to use. You should be measure that. Are they using it? And usually that helps a lot. Like, oh, this didn't quite hit. This one did. Okay, so this is what the community is interested in. Okay, we can make a choice there. Um, other metrics that I think are important are around the community, which is like, how many contributor, community contributed articles are there? I mean, that that is, without that, mm -hmm. your community is gonna die. Um, it's just gonna wither. And so we look at how many contributed articles there are, how many posted use cases, that sort of thing. Um, engagement levels there. So those are my two easy hot buckets. I mean, there's a lot of metrics inside those, but those are two that I think, um, without getting overwhelming with this data dump, I think those are really two that you should always consider. Always start out with the idea that everything you provide is without a transaction. So you're not asking, here, if I give you some education, you'll give me something. Never start with a transaction. You will get value from your community later on. Don't lose sight of that. You know, this is, and Jono, if you're listening, I'm using your words. Um, this is the thing. <laughs> um, when you, when you have your, you know, you have your outreach and your awareness, but when you get that new user, don't think that once you have a user that, that now this is like a source for all new content. No, th that will evolve. But just getting out of this idea that every community member is a transaction is such a good thing because you will run people off so fast um, when you're like, Oh, I saw you click the link. Would you like to do six use cases and fill out a blog and do all this? Like, ah, get away from me. Um, just think about that. At the beginning, I think you really focus on the contributor. Uh, as you move, you're probably looking into influencer. Then you're looking into users. So I think you probably care all three at different stage, but you will wait. You put different weights at different stages. For example, at the, at the beginning, we put a lot of efforts on the contributor because that is the way uh, how early adopters were using Pulsar. They would they they use it, they contribute it because the the, the project is not perfect. It's it's still not mature enough, so you still need to fix bug. So uh, uh, like having contributor contributing, having those contributors talking about Pulsar, that is the way how you plant the seeds of the community and then go from there. But as you grow there, you probably don't need a lot of contributors or the you're looking more these uh, users. So that means then how can you get people uh, from not knowing about Pulsar towards writing the first application? That is the channel 
that is the, that's, that is the path that we need to shorten. And how to shorten that? That is would be the community focus. Is that are we going to optimize the documentation? Are we going to optimize the entire download um, so that we can get people from doesn't know about Forza towards building the first application? Then this is the, the this is the top funnel. And then once they build the first application, then how we can drive the them to use more features there? Then that that is going through the rest of the the I would say um, nurturing uh, process is to get people use excited excited about more features excited 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 about kind of the uh, a lot of benefits coming out on Pulsar, and then you are able to insert certain like interactions through uh, your Dapro team through your potential support team or uh, uh, account executive to work with those people in that journey. I think, uh, you know, uh, the number one and the absolute number one thing that, you know, we live and die by inside AppSmith uh, is our developer retention. Uh, that's that's pretty much the main thing that we really care about. Uh, and what this means is it's not about getting new developers. It's uh, it's really just about making sure that every developer who checks out the product like sticks around for the long run. And if they didn't, like, you know, why did they stick around? Like, you know, what stopped them? Uh, from actually you know, using AppSmith. So it's the kind of product that could pretty much help you in your, pre in your everyday work. You could use it for like a ton of things, whether it's your, your side hobby project or your actual uh, work uh, for internal tools or you know even experimenting on uh, you know something uh, on a side business if you'd like. Um, so you know we we'd, we'd consistently keep asking that question, and you know we'd be obsessed with uh, you know what is our developer retention, and you know how do we measure it, and how do we make sure that the developer retention gets better, um, and and that would be like our core metric internally. One of the primary reasons people look at open source as a successful um, strategy is because it enables you to work directly with the community and collect their feedback. The more feedback you can get on how people use or view your product, the better product you can build. So how do you set up a user feedback program? What sort of things should you do to engage with the community or collect information? Let's ask a few people. Um medical condition and goes go somewhere and then the first responses are, are meaningless it really doesn't count as, as giving any value uh, but the first time you get a meaningful response that's something we want to uh, that we have started measuring and are uh, and are reducing and then as for the blockers it is <clears throat> like inside the foundation itself we have a number of developers who some of them are better at the optimizer. Some of them are better at you know, DB and uh, there would be like areas of specialization. But the, the code is, is so deep that, that there clearly will be areas where we don't know uh, as much as is needed to accept the contribution and even to be properly able to, to judge it. Uh, and, and then what we have to do there is to find the people which usually are inside the, the corporation and, and uh, nudge them and, and to see whether they think this is an interesting thing or, or, or something that needs to be done or not. So, so this is like going into the details of how we actually do our work with the uh, contributor community. Now then there would be of course the, the user community. And user sounds much way more simpler than a contributor but sometimes it can be highly complicated and one, of, one such case happened last year, uh, one of our biggest uh, users is, is Wikimedia Foundation. They run like Wikipedia and Wikidata and Wikimedia Commons and all of that run on MariaDB. And they, they would be upgrading at certain intervals and, and, and uh, we, we have been chatting with them about uh, when they would upgrade and to which version. And then, then we got, um, so we don't, we don't have like every quarter a specific meeting or we at least did not. Then we got a note from um, their main Maria DB, DBA saying that when we were upgrading to 10.6, uh, in the middle of our upgrade process, we got uh, uh, a huge problem because uh, uh, the newer, uh, we had migrated, was it 15 or so, so they were in the early phase of migrating Maria DB. They, they, uh, they had uh, upgraded 15 of them, and then when they got a denial of service kind of attack, uh, the uh, servers were hanging. 
And it was hugely complicated to, to debug, to identify where the bug was. And because it wasn't possible to reproduce it. The, the bug as such was not reprodu reproducible under a normal load, only when they had some, some level of hacking attack on them. And you, you, you are hard pressed to find an organization which is more open than Wikimedia Foundation. But not even they can be open when it comes to how hackers hack them, because that would simplify the life of the hackers. So this was a long, long process of first identifying the, pro, uh, the bug, uh, then making it reproducible, and then fix it. And the fix was three lines of code. So that was not the issue. It was finding it. it was, and, and, and this is truly about the metrics of, of, of open uh, of, of, uh, not of openness, but, but of adoption. I mean, the number of users uh, of Wikipedia is huge and they're relying on MariaDB and that's, that's a sense of pride for us. And, and, and this, like, this was one of the key uh, experiences of last year. I don't know exactly how it relates to your question about how we uh, create uh, adoption, but though that's an example of something we devoted a lot of energy to last year. One of the reasons you build community is to open up those channels for valuable feedback. Um, and, and so, right, so it, it, it's doing things like, yeah, yeah appreci like appreciating them, showcasing them, sending, like I remember, I mean, even now I, I, I have to bring it back, but I do these like Cafe Yana video series. And so I send everyone like a little like thank you note. Like I send everyone like a little like thank you note, just handwritten thank you note after. Uh, so like a little like early, I think what's really nice in the early days, and I think you don't have to think about scale yet. So a lot of the things you do can still be very personal and one off and like a handwritten note and a hand curated like a little gift box or um, a free ticket to a conference. Like we did, the, um, I launched these, it was our core contributor gifts. And so they were these like curated boxes where we did like, because we only, let's say we have like 15 contributors to Terraform. So there were only 15 of those t-shirts ever designed. Um, and the, like I put in there like a little like they were called golden tickets. It was like the Willy Wonka golden ticket where it was free tickets to our user conference um, and, and a handwritten note by Mitchell from Mitchell and Armand and a few other little things in there that people like really appreciated. And then we would like we would spot those T-shirts out in the wild and then people would be like, well, how do I get those? It's like, well, by, it's by contributing. And then other people were like, well, well, now I want like the, the console one or the Nomad one. Right. So it kind of created this like little fun game. So it's, it's little things like that, um, early access to things. Because um, again, right, I think at the end of the day, this isn't easy, right? And, and people really appreciate learning from each other and feeling like they're connected to something. If you are running an open source business or you're trying to commercialize your open source, you can't avoid the community. In fact, you should put community before the commercialization. Let's listen to a few founders and a few critical experts in the space on what they have to say about whether community or commercialization is more important. Uh, I, I think one of the big lessons that I learned is the don't do any commercialization when you don't have uh, community. So that means the uh, because the the way how community so uh, the way how commercialized uh, work is that you need to sell value. And what what is the value? Open source is not a value you're selling to uh, customers. Also, uh, open source project itself, it has the value, but it's open source. You you you're not going to commercialize that. So, the way how it works is that you really need to uh, find the signal in the community. So people would use that like that technology like that work. So you, you just keep working on that, bring more uh, functionality into Pulsar and uh, make it attractive and people start using it. And then at that point, people start asking questions in the community is, do you have a managed service? Do you have uh, a commercial uh, uh, enterprise distribution? Uh, uh, I think there's a security feature lacking. Uh, is there any vendor providing that? If people start asking that, then that is the first signal you catch from the community. And that is the time you, you see uh, people, there's an ask coming into uh, the community asking for commercial. And that is the point that you start looking into how you should build a commercial product. And th those initial people who ask questions will become your 
early adapters of your product, you can you can uh, you use the relationship you built in the community to really talk to those users to ask for what they are looking for. Is it are you looking for postal experts? Are you looking for um, you don't have the resources to run a public cloud? And you're looking into a fully managed services. Are you looking into uh, enterprise uh, sorry security related features? What are the features that you're looking for? And that is the conversation happening would trigger uh, the the uh, company looking into find uh, to build the product and find what is the product market fit uh, in order to do the commercial. I, I think uh, it, it wasn't too difficult conversation, to be honest, because um, we were always clear that we were building this platform for, uh, you know, the uh, for the long uh, for the long run. And uh, in order to do that, we had to build a really good platform um, that was extremely stable, that, um, you know, had um, that had immense developer love. Um, and I think that was always our core goal and our core focus, whether it was internally within the team or, you know, uh, externally within uh, the community or even, you know, within our investors. Um, our core focus has always been like create something that, uh, you know, developers out there would really, really love. And and until we were absolutely confident that, uh, you know, we had something like that, we didn't even want to think about monetization. So I think uh, a lot of it comes down to, uh, you know, propagating that belief in what you're building and just having that alignment with everyone that, you know, we are going to continue to kind of build it this way. And um, yeah, I think we've just, uh, we've just been very transparent about that. And I think, especially with the community, you'd, you'd be surprised, but uh, I think it, it, the conversation with the community was a lot harder because there would be so many people who would ask for features like granular access control and audit logs and SSO and wonder why we're just not building it. And, you know, they, they consistently follow up every, uh, you know, the two to three months and say like, you know, when is this feature launching? And and we'd have to be really transparent and just say, hey, I'm, I'm sorry, I understand you're a slightly larger organization and team and, you know, you'd see a lot of value from this, but, uh, you know, there are all these, you know, 20 other features that uh, the large community is just really struggling with right now. And, you know, our priorities are there before we can get to this. And, and you know, being really transparent about that was, was very, very important for us. I have so much, emp- I have so much empathy for founders. Uh, just, just in general, right? I've never had the guts to start my own thing. I've always been really like enjoyed supporting founders, but especially now, right? As the as the markets have changed, and and it's really cool, right? Because now I'm on the investment side, so now I evaluate companies through the like the lens of, you know, can this one day be a big business? Kind of like you know, what's the do they have product market fit, right? What's their like monetization strategy at some point? You know, when HashiCorp when we raised our it was. Our A, we asked investors to give us two years. So ba- back in the day, we weren't even thinking about monetization. So we we're like, we want to first completely dominate in the open source and, and get that open source traction. And you see the change, right? So first, you're just like, you're doing a lot of outbound, right? You're you're writing content, you're going to meetups, you're speaking, you're doing one-on-one stuff. And at some point, you feel this this like tipping point where all of a sudden you see that like that hockey stick curve and then as other people are talking about you and other people are sharing and that's when you re- right like once you get that kind of like peer-to-peer uh validation and peer-to-peer sharing that's when you really see kind of those tractions take off but again we asked we asked our investors to give us two years um before we even started to think about monetization and it's kind of tough now right because um, to, to be able to raise a proper A, you have to uh, like be at a million ARR or show kind of a repeatable sales model that you'll get there. So it's people just have less time. Um, and it's also interesting, right? Cause I've been a community builder my whole career. And now I'm actually telling founders to be like, yes, community is important, but if it doesn't like, it has to really directly drive towards what are the business goals and be so closely connected when in, in turn, community building is a long game. As we see, Community is vitally important to any open source project. We hope that you enjoy this video and that you'll like and subscribe to future videos. If you did want to hear more from our guests, each one of them has a podcast on our channel. We encourage you to check it out. Don't forget to like and subscribe. Until next time, thanks.